name is Nicole Jaffermans. I'm the editor in chief of the journal Intensive Care Medicine Experimental. And also on behalf of my co moderator, Mervyn Singer, I'm very happy to welcome you to the first webinar organized by ICMX. So we launched the initi initiative this year to give authors of papers accepted into ICMX the opportunity to, to discuss their findings on a webinar. Um, and the papers that we picked are either thought provoking or providing a novel angle to a problem. And in any case, they have to deal with a relevant clinical question. So the papers that we'll discuss today definitely meet all of those descriptions. So before I give the word to, uh, to Mervyn, I'd also like to announce for those of you who haven't heard yet, that intensive care experimental will receive its first impact factor uh, at the beginning of next year. So uh, I'm not able to tell you the exact number now because that needs to be officially launched, but according to our own calculations, it is really looking good. So very happy to be able to say that. So now over to you, Mervyn. Lovely. Thank you very, very much indeed, Nicole. It's a huge pleasure to co-chair with you um, and also a huge pleasure to see ICMX gets an impact factor uh, after many years, well deserved. Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm competing. Sorry. I, no, I apologize. I'm in a railway station and they're just giving out an announcement. So give me 10 seconds and it will finish. I apologize. Right. right. So I do apologize. I'm in a railway station, but hopefully I'll be mute for the rest of the talk. So what we're going to do is have a really interesting discussion today about our current understanding of the immune response in critical illness in sepsis. And, you know, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of State under George Bush, you know, he talked about known knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. They're the things we know we know, there are the things we know we don't know, and there are the things we don't know we don't know. And I think that very much applies to our current understanding of the host response. So, you know, once upon a time, life was very simple. We had a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And then it got a little bit more complicated because the thinking was, about 30 years ago that SIRS was followed by a compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome. And then it got even more complicated because people worked out that both were happening at the same time. And now it's got even more complicated because there are different components of the immune inflammatory response. Some are increased and some are depressed at the same time. And we can, in terms of unknown unknowns, we can add further complexity in terms of what we measure is essentially what we sample from the blood, but we don't know what happens at the organ level. And each organ actually carries an immune inflammatory component of its own. I apologize again for the thing, sorry. I should finish soon. They're just calling a train to London. I'm X1, so I do apologize. Eurostar number 9039, living so at 3.13, <laughs> to London St. Pancras International, it's is about to leave. Lovely. Immediate boarding, platform number five. So I do apologise. This is, I hope, the last time this will happen to me. Um, so I, I think now we're moving on. It's even more interesting, more complex. And our two great speakers today will introduce other questions, you know, the impact of stress and how the body stress response influences our immune response. There are concepts of resilience and tolerance, how accurate they are. Again, interesting hypothesis, and I'll be really interested to see how both our speakers actually uh, give their views as to the current thinking around these concepts. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, He's a great friend of mine, Professor Michael Bauer. He is head of anesthesiology and intensive care at the Jena University Hospital, Jena, Germany. He's also head of a huge sepsis research institute, the Center for Sepsis 
care and control or control and care, I can't remember which way around. Um, and Michael is, you know, a, a polymath. So he's got lots of multiple talents, including cookery, he assures me. But he's very well trained in basic science, molecular biology and so forth. And he brings these skills to bear very much with the translational science. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Michael to give us the first talk. Thank you. Oops. Yeah, thank you, Mervyn. Um, yeah, organisms are perpetually facing environmental challenges and stress in this context is defined as the reaction of a biological system to a potential harmful factor that acts on the organism as such. These reactions are well conserved across species or even kingdoms. And although I was told that I should, with my German accent, not make this joke, uh, I'm going to speak today of maize and men. Um, you have heard a lot of talks about mice and men, and uh, now it's going to be maize. So why is this conserved across kingdoms? Um, I would just like to shed light on these fundamental responses from the point of view of evolutionary ecology across kingdoms. And when we speak about the intensive care unit, it's obvious that there are many stressors that act on a single patient. There might be calorie restriction, there might be fever, there are PAMPs and DAMPs due to infection and tissue injury. And it's obvious that our poor patient on the ICU can only move to one stress response. So there must be some funnel and integration of all these stress, event that, stress events that occur in parallel. And this signal integration then needs to lead to a single phenotype, how the cell, the organ or the organism responds. And uh, we know that this may be kind of a primed state or a trained immune response. It may be a tolerance induction, or it may be leading to overt damage. This is linked to the magnitude of the stress event. And just as one example, the pathogen load is obviously in the septic patient one potential a stress factor that can be scaled up depending on the number of bacteria or colony forming units, which uh, is also used as a surrogate in many of these uh, studies that look into tolerance responses. Um, that is a clear um, influential factor here. And um, how can the cell respond? This depends definitely on the energy resources that are available and there are systems within the cell such as the transcriptional um, master regulators mTOR and AMPK that are able to sense the energy state of the response and um, I would like to go through the recent developments with you and how we conceptualize this response and uh, it's intuitively that the most yeah, straightforward way is to deal with these interacting stress events in a way that you try to integrate it into one sum up reaction. And that's essentially what has been done here in this nice uh, review um, by Dr. Maslow from Canada, where we just get introduced to the concept that all these individual insults and biological abnormalities are connected in our patients and you just have to somehow integrate them in order to define a phenotype that is either net pro or net anti-inflammatory for instance in a way that you can really move from this response to uh, something you can treat as a physician. Nevertheless, and it's now uh, 10 years since this landmark paper was published by Ruslan Metzitov, um, Dr. Schneider and Miguel Suarez in Science, where they just taking from plant physiology a concept that there are responses by the um, infected host 
that are directed to reduce the number of pathogens, which are referred to as resistance responses. But there are also alternative responses that can dampen the damage that is introduced either by the pathogen or by the immune response. And as you are all well aware as intensivists, that the tolerance capacity of some organs is better than of others. So a brain won't tolerate a lot of stress or damage compared to, for instance, skin or liver, where you have a huge uh, regenerative capacity. Um, and all these uh, events have to be somehow integrated. And this concept of a two component defense response that involves both resistance as well as tolerance responses has been well described by plant ecologists to assess plant health and pathogen plant interactions and the surrogate for tolerance in these uh, responses was the harvest so if you could harvest despite the presence of plant pathogens then the organism to some extent was obviously able to deal with this stressor um, in an adaptive way, and this was termed tolerance. So it may make sense to look in more detail into these plant responses. As I already mentioned, these concepts are well conserved across kingdoms because they are fundamental to the cell response to stress. So what are the uh, resistance reactions that a plant can move? These plants are uh, modular organisms and have exceptional regenerative capacities, much more than most mammals, for instance. So accordingly, tolerance can be a very prominent way to cope with stress. On the other hand side, at the bottom of the food chain, you have to take a lot. So defenses must also include defense against all these herbivores that want to eat you. And the resistance mechanisms are well characterized um, and include constitutive and induced defenses. So despite the fact that the plant has no mobile sentinel cells or vulgo no immune system, they can defend themselves in a basal expression. So there is some basal defense mechanism, but there are also upregulatory mechanisms how to upregulate uh, these defenses. And uh, so there seems to be different challenges, such as to be in the bottom of the uh, food chain, or similar changes, such as infection by pathogens. And how are these um, responses comparable across kingdoms? And when you look, for instance, at uh, plant versus vertebrate immunity, it's really striking that regarding innate immune mechanisms, microbe-associated molecular PEMs can be perceived as an example of convergent evolution. And this has probably evolved similarly in both vertebrate as well as plant cells. So there is obviously a strong evolutionary component to these um, response patterns and it's obvious as i already mentioned that the costs of living will determine how you respond to a stress event no matter whether you are a plant or a vertebrate uh, you have to take care uh, of your energies that are uh, at your disposal so reproduce reproducive um, uh, energy um, expenditure is going to be downsizable much easier or you can um, not grow for a while but these maintenance and repair or tolerance and defense mechanisms they have to be uh, maintained and uh, in particular as the strain the, as the environmental stressor increases in the order of magnitude you have to just reprioritize your energy resources and these induced defense uh, mechanisms enable the organism to be energy saving at times of peace if you assume that the energy is grossly uh, 
um, constant. And as soon as stress occurs, you have to reprioritize your energy resources and direct more towards maintenance and repair or defense. And this is very intriguing as a concept in particular, as the changes may also affect the available energy in the cell. So it's not just that the costs may increase and typical for intensive care, there might also be a reduced resource. So you might have to prioritize your coping mechanisms and just avoid defense responses that are energy consuming and move more to dormancy responses as here introduced once again by Ruslan Metsitov, who already came up with the original idea of this uh, tolerance phenomenon. So what factors will define whether you can um, go into these various response patterns? So it's obvious that it depends on your regenerative capacity. So plants may behave different than vertebrates. It also depends to your overall ecological strategy and also to the resource availability. So I would like to introduce you to two theories, the optimal defense theory from plant physiology, as well as the R versus K strategy that is a fundamental principle in ecology. So the costs of living um, are under stress conditions sometimes fairly dramatic and uh, tolerance may be very fine. So you just save energy, but this also comes at no uh, cost. Um, so to lose a limb to save a life, you know that uh, famous saying is a lot easier to tolerate when you are able to regrow your limb after the stress event is uh, disappearing as in plants or also in this axolotl, which is an uh, animal uh, that can really lose a limb and just regenerate after the uh, stress event is um, um, just yeah, controlled. And this uh, optimal defense theory in the context of ecology would imply that the level of protection of a given organ or tissue correlates with its overall importance for the fitness of the host. So um, extrapolating this concept from plants where regenerative reproductive tissues are well preserved and young leaves are prioritized over old leaves, the same may hold true for brain, liver and kidney or other organs in the human host. So um, let's have a look at this optimal defense theory. So you have to invest for instance, these plants here, what they do in order to protect their uh, more important um, parts of the plant against herbivores, they synthesize a compound called glucosinolate and they have energy consuming transporters and the concentration as a result of this phenomenon in the young leaves and in the reproductive tissues is much higher so that the herbivores just go for the old leaves and avoid the young leaves. Um, and when you knock out uh, this transporter, the glucosinolate concentration is equal across the plant and the herbivores also go for the very uh, nice young leaves and also for the reproductive um, tissues. So this is an energy consuming response that you invest in order to protect your uh, most important parts for survival and the same holds true on the whole organism level the whole organism level for the r versus k strategy so smaller plants or mice which may be part of the problem why mice don't always lead to translatable strategies into the clinical field these animals with small size early reproduction and many but small offspring they have a different strategy to deal with stress than humans um, as k strategic um, mammals that have a large size delayed reproduction few but large offspring small reproductive allocation and much parental care so 
in the case strategic um, uh, animals, mammals, but also plants, the reproductive strategy will lead to a lot more impact and you need to um, invest a lot more in repair and survival uh, to uh, allow evolutionary success than in these are strategic um, animals or plants. So survival contributes more to fitness in the long-lived species relative to the short-lived species. And uh, this is a very fundamental principle that um, may lead to some discrepancies between mouse and uh, mouse data in research and uh, the translation into the clinical context. And what is also very important in this context is that resistance and tolerance traits, they will obviously interact in determining how disease the fitness in this case of the plants where it has been studied because resistance is beneficial only when disease reduces fitness and this does not occur if the plants are tolerant and vice versa so these two traits will not evolve independently so they are requiring energy they are requiring um, really um, for instance atp and they definitely interact because they rely on each other. So perhaps it's better to avoid to put these two phenomena into an opposing uh, situation, tolerance versus resistance, and rather reconciliate these seemingly opposed responses as a state of resilience where tolerance and resistance interact and the ability of a system to return to a stable state that involves both tolerance and resistance will define uh, how well you can deal with the stress um, and how well you will tolerate for instance infection and this has essentially already been proposed by Hans Selye some 80 years ago in his fundamental work on stress and when you just um, integrate these responses um, and just map it against the energy expenditure and the energy resources that you have available. It's obviously that, for instance, the infection and other stressors will just uh, require that you take care that you invest. Oops, that you invest energy in these resistance and tolerance responses up to a point where the resilience response is just overwhelmed and allostatic overload um, will occur and the system fails. And that there is some phenotype type that is closely related to energetic cause has been, for instance, observed here by um, my friend and colleague Thomas Rüttel, Daniel Thomas Rüttel. Uh, when you look here at um, the huge study that he conducted in more than 6,500 patients. There are two clear phenotypes that different that behave very differently regarding their energy metabolism. Uh, and you already see it at the body temperature. The ones with fever do a lot better than the ones with um, a hypothermic response. And um, Richard Hotchkiss has nicely shown in this um, yeah, uh, theory generating paper that was just published a couple of weeks ago in critical care medicine that this um, state of hypothermia is associated with worth outcome and that a therapeutic um, hyperthermia can improve, can be used to improve survival in afebrile critically ill patients with sepsis. So somehow there seems to be an overall hypothermic and uh, hypoenergetic state and a more energy consuming state that are associated here um, also with the clinical phenotype of sepsis. And regarding the optimal defense theory, there are also clear data supporting a highly localized and compartmentalized response in various organs. So while, for instance, pro-inflammatory reactions may be present in one organ, such as the lungs, 
there might be severe immunosuppression in other parts of the body, such as the spleen or the bone marrow. So dysfunctions of the immune response that are considered as a hallmark of sepsis can be temporally and spatially very distinct, um, which may just reflect that the different um, organs are subject also to some optimal defense theory. And when you try to integrate the two observations, the energy that is invested may be less for the kidney and more for, for instance, lung and liver, and probably most care will be taken for the brain. Uh, but nevertheless, once you move along this continuum, you will reach to some extent a state of allostatic overload, and then the stress response gets out of control, and you can't restore a state of resilience. Um, so then uh, the multiple organ failure just gets out of control. And this will then add to the mystery of mods introduced by Mervyn Singer. Um, and uh, what I would like to convey to you is that the phenotyping that we are currently trying to achieve that integrates the life history traits as well as biotic and abiotic stress that occur at the same time is very intriguing. But we have also to be aware that it's not just inflammation tolerance needs to be acknowledged as another defensive trait which improves our understanding. Um, of the biology of multiple organ failure and the ecological strategies that I tried to introduce, like, such as the R versus K strategy, um, would suggest that we have to handle these comparisons across species with care, uh, what we have already all perceived from our mouse data and the lack of translatability into the human ICU. And I would also try to get you enthusiastic about the optimal defense theory and the implications that localized responses need to be more in our uh, interest uh, when we speak about our patients on the intensive care. And overall, we should not try to fool Mother Nature. And I would like to thank you for your attention and Margit Leitner in my group, who is a plant physiologist and introduced me to the flowery thoughts. Thank you uh, for your attention. That's wonderful. Um, thank you for that talk, uh, Michael Bauer. And I'm sure that there will be lots of uh, questions about this fascinating talk about our response to stress. But um, uh, I propose that we uh, go on to the next talk and save the questions to the end. And I would like to remind you that you can put your questions also via the app. Um, and now um, I would like to introduce uh, the, the second speaker. It's Dr. Gomez. He is an associate professor at the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. And he's also a program director of the uh, Anesthesia and Critical Care Fellowship Program. And he's an expert on mechanisms of sepsis-related sepsis uh, organ failure. Um, and um, he will follow up, I think, nicely with a, a, a very relevant paper, I thought, uh, about phenotyping of sepsis, and particularly the macrophage activating syndrome. So over to you, Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Nicole. I want to thank you for, for the kind invitation. Very excited to be here. And of course, um, uh, thank you to Professor Singer for uh, co-chairing this session. Uh, tough uh, act to follow uh, from Professor Bauer, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about a, uh, some work that we've done in this space of uh, attempting to phenotype patients with sepsis and try to understand whether we can reach um, specific therapies that might be a little bit more effective than what we have so far. These are my disclosures, uh, some scientific, scientific advisory uh, roles uh, with, uh, with uh, industry and some grant funding. But um, the tension for this work initiated a, a while ago with uh, a clinical uh, circumstance that I'm sure many here have faced. Um, you, you get a patient that is 55 years old, male, has as low of comorbidities, patient arrives in your ICU with a bacterial pneumonia, rapidly de develops respiratory failure, AKI and shock, stays one month in the ICU with multiple organ dysfunction syndrome and dies. 
month later, you receive the patient that you could swear is the is the brother of the previous patient that you that you had. 58 years old, same comorbidity, same bacterial pneumonia, but this patient only requires high flow oxygen per diesel cannula, stays five days in the ICU and survives. And, and, and we can't help but wonder uh, what are the underlying differences between these two patients that lead to so divergent courses and divergent outcomes, um, which are essentially not apparent uh, at the clinical level with clinical features. And I think that the, the field has moved, uh, has made a healthy move uh, from understanding sepsis as a uh, homogeneous syndrome uh, and rather uh, understand that this is a very heterogeneous syndrome where um, many mechanisms might be at play and many types of presentations in our patients can, can also occur. And uh, this is just one example of many uh, a paper that we published with Chris Seymour a few years ago, demonstrating that if you use some techniques to analyze big data, you can actually identify diverse uh, subphenotypes of patients uh, within the, the sepsis universe. And that they actually fare rather differently in terms of their trajectories, their organ involvement, and their outcome. So uh, I would submit to you, though, that this is this is barely scratching the surface, right? Because if phenotypes and subphenotypes give us a little bit of an understanding of what's going on, and furthermore point us towards uh, the development of effective therapies, which is what we all want as physicians, uh, I would suggest that perhaps diving into the uh, understanding of the true endotypes would be a, a, a valuable uh, search. And so, so we're talking about the same uh, language here. Phenotypes are, of course, specific set of traits resulting from interaction of genotypes and the environment that result in that specific trajectory, we could call that sepsis. A subgroup of, uh, a, so phenotypes are a subgroup with specific multidimensional characteristics within that phenotype, we could call that septic shock, if you will. But then the endotypes are these biological subgroups that are defined by a distinct mechanism within that phenotype, and therefore are susceptible to specific therapies or potentially susceptible to specific therapy uh, development. Now, the other subgroup that is interesting to look at are those patients, those subphenotypes that perhaps are responsive to a specific treatment, that perhaps you haven't fleshed out entirely what the actual mechanism of disease is, but you were able to demonstrate that if you expose these patients to a specific drug A, they respond favorably and do better. Um, so can we attain these endotypes? Can we get there? Um, and I, I would submit to you that, yes, there are several lines of investigation that might get us there. Of course, the hypothesis-driven experimental work with the caveats of translation that Dr. Bauer was mentioning that we've all suffered through. Uh, the reappraisal of randomized clinical trials, the many, many negative clinical trials that we have had is probably a source of a lot of data to try to uh, reinvent how we understand sepsis. And further, uh, of course, uh, as you saw from the previous example, unsupervised and data-driven approaches that help us parse out these subgroups of patients within the septic universe. So the, the, the interesting work by Vita Shakuri is what got us very interested in this presentation of macrophage activation syndrome within uh, the concept of sepsis. Macrophage activation syndrome, uh, or MAS as we will call it from now on, is a state of hyperactivation of the immune system in response to a trigger that is characterized by a deficiency in the immune system, which is essentially a deficient natural killer, cell cytotoxic functions, which leads to unchecked expansion of uh, the activation of uh, macrophages, leads to a cytokine storm that ends up damaging organs and causing unacceptably high uh, death rates. Um, MAS is a newcomer to critical uh, care uh, and critical illness. Um, although it's been there for a long time in other patient populations like the rheumatologic uh, patients and patients with malignancy. And MAS has been considered part of these hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytic syndromes, of which of course the, the prototype is the familial HLH, where 
uh, the culprit lesion is a biallelic genetic mutation in a specific pathway that deals with NK cells being able to do their job, which is mutations in the perforin and granzyme pathway. And we'll talk about that later. However, that's not what we see in our patients. Uh, there's also a secondary HLH um, in, in the current classification from uh, the rheumatologists and hematologists that suggests that these syndromes are associated with conditions that produce chronic inflammation. Like, for example, um, uh, the old uh, uh, Stills disease or adult onset Stills disease, cancer, medications, and chronic liver dysfunction. And there have been some data suggesting that there might be not homozygous, but heterozygous mutations within these same pathways of NK cell function that actually might contribute to this in the context of stressors or triggers like viral uh, infections with uh, cytomegalovirus and Epstein bar virus. And of course, the newcomer is an MAS like sepsis or MODS. We still don't know how to call this. The, the, the Professor Jamarellis has called this macrophage activation like syndrome. Um, but essentially, these are syndromes that occur within the septic population and that are associated with other types of stressors that we'll go over in a second. So, one of the key challenges to translate this into clinical practice is that the diagnosis of MAS is extremely challenging. Most people use uh, the HLH 2004 score which is a, a very complete score, but to detect HLH. Uh, and remember that this is being borrowed from these other concepts of the hematophagocytic syndromes, uh, which is composed, of course, of a molecular diagnosis, trying to identify these mutations that we talked about. And of course, clinical criteria that you see there, like fever, splenomegaly, profound cytopenias, hypertriglyceridemia or hypofibrinogenemia, hemophagocytosis in the biopsy of bone marrows, which we never do in the ICU, and um, uh, low or absent NK cell activity uh, with increased ferritin levels. Ferritin has become an important metric and biomarker to detect the development of these hyperinflammatory syndromes. And this has evolved with several permutations of these criteria, but I would suggest to you that uh, all of these are relatively flawed in the, in the face of a septic patient, primarily because none of these criteria have ever been validated in the septic population. Um, and there's other components, like, for example, the cytopenias that we see in sepsis might be a little bit uh, less uh, profound than what, what uh, other patient populations see. Uh, and for instance, the ferritin levels that we might see in septic patients might be higher than the cutoffs. That, are pre, that these criteria are presented. But nevertheless, um, I guess this is why uh, the work by, by Vita Shakuri and colleagues was so, so uh, eye-opening. Because um, what they did was to take the, the uh, trial uh, of um, IL-1 receptor antagonist Anakinra uh, done by Stephen Opal uh, at the end of the 90s uh, this was a study uh, that was done in septic patients, uh, and they were randomized to treatment with IL-1 receptor antagonists. And as you see, the, the study was halted uh, prematurely as it was uh, um, negative for futility. What they, what they conceptuated and hypothesized is that if, if they were able to actually identify patients that had features of potential macrophage activation syndrome, perhaps the response to therapy in this study would have been different. And the beauty of it is the simplicity of what they did. They decided to take two salient features of patients with macrophage activation syndrome, i.e. hepatobiliary dysfunction and disseminated intravascular coagulation, and they decided that that was going to be the subphenotype that they were going to study. And when they looked at it, this is what they saw. Patients with the HBD DIC phenotype that were treated with placebo had unacceptably high mortality, 65%. However, if you would see those patients and you would treat them with IL-1 uh, receptor antagonists, they saw an absolute reduction of 30% of mortality. And more importantly, when you see the two lines up top, those are patients that did not have this subphenotype and were essentially oblivious to the, to the treatment with IL-1 receptor antagonists. So this was, again, 
very eye-opening. Um, why the tar why target the IL-1 receptor? And this this is where we need to get a little bit more into the nitty-gritty of the of the um, etiology and how how the mechanisms work in this in this space. The prototypical um, uh, disease process is, of course, the familial HLH, and, and you know already that this is driven by autosomic recessive immune disorders. But the secondary HLH and MAS are more dependent on other stressors, like, for example, chronic inflammation, infections, and activation of other pathways that lead as a unison to a deficiency of the perforin grand sign pathway and decreased NK cell activity. Experimental studies have shown also that the TLR uh, total receptor 9 MID88 activation uh, of that pathway is extremely important for this syndrome to uh, uh, re be reproduced in, in, in animal species. And this, of course, leads to a common pathway of unchecked expansion of cyto cytotoxic lymphocytes and macrophages. And this leads to the downstream effects which is essentially that cytokine storm that we've heard, particularly in COVID times, uh, that are, is driven primarily by IL-1 beta, IL-18, and a uh, forward feedback loop that I'll show you in a second, driven also by the excretion of extracellular ferritin. And of course, this leads to the pattern of organ dysfunction and death that we see in these patients. So um, work done by uh, Kate Kerner here from Pittsburgh demonstrated in six patients with septic shock derived from the process trial. The process trial was a, a trial that enrolled septic shock patients and um, uh, randomized them to three uh, potential therapies, um, a standard of care or two protocolized resuscitation strategies. But essentially they took the six patients that had the highest levels of ferritin and they looked at the genome and they demonstrated that three out of those six patients had um, out mutations that were similar to the mutations that HLH patients have. Uh, of course, these were not biallelic. They were uh, of lower penetrance and they were um, uh, heterozygous, but nevertheless suggesting that patients within this realm might actually be responsive to IL-1 receptor antagonists treatment. The NK cell is critical. Uh, NK cells uh, are important to induce apoptosis in, vir in, in infected uh, cells or by viruses, in cells that have morphed into cancerous phenotypes, but importantly, is in a key cell that turns off the inflammation in macrophages, dendritic cells, and other uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes. They do that by secreting these granules with granzyme and perforin that open pores within the target cell inject um, the granzymes and initiate a caspase uh, driven or led uh, apoptotic um, event that leads to the death of that target cell. And that target cell releases a, a key signal that is also caspase mediated that releases the contact of that uh, uh, natural killer cell from the from the target. This was beautifully demonstrated by Boss Koboinik in his study. Here you're seeing the cytotoxic lymphocyte and the target cell, and you see how the progression goes in which the cytotoxic lymphocyte touches the target cell and then dumps in there all these granzymes that will lead to the development of apoptosis in red, as you see here. And you see the cell, the target cell here becoming more rounded, which is a sign of apoptosis, and how the cytotoxic cell just detaches from, uh, from that uh, cell. Well, see what happens. Oh, by the way, this happens very quickly, six, six minutes. See what happens when you have absence of perforin or absence of granzymes A and B. And I'll summarize it for you. No apoptosis of the target cell meaning that now your macrophage that was activated will continue to ride activated. And second, the time of contact increases dramatically, and that has important implications for the cytokine production. Look, when you have absence of these enzymes as compared to wild type, you see dramatic increments in this spillage of inflammatory mediators by CD8 T cells, and NK cells that can go 30, 20, 80 times higher 
than patient that, that than the cells that actually have these enzymes on board. So of course, this leads to this macrophage clonal expansion in cytokine storm. And this sort of uh, figure puts it together. And I want to emphasize in this figure that feed forward loop that I was talking to you about as PAMs and DAMs are released from, sep from uh, during sepsis. The activation of TLR9 pathways lead to inflammasome activation and the secretion of IL-1 beta and IL-18 that lead in the liver particularly to the release of ferritin. And ferritin is an important mediator of an increase in expression of TLR9s and feedback forward loop uh, secreting more and more IL-1 beta and IL-18. In addition, sepsis induces high levels of IL-6 and IL-10 that lead to dysfunction of the NK cells and to a decrease in the response of the NK cell to IL-18 because of a downregulation of receptors uh, for IL-18. And this is important because the NK cell I told you was the, the police. These are the cells that will say, well, you need to stop your inflammation right now. And therefore, you have an unabated um, production of cytokines that leads to uh, sufficient injury. And therefore, the use of IL-1 receptor antagonists might be very instrumental in at least halting this, this, uh, this cycle. If you will, the analogy is that these patients are essentially in a car uh, that is speeding away without brakes. And if you can actually, at least with the IL-1 receptor antagonist, take the foot off the, the, the gas, then you might actually give these patients a shot. So this leads to what we did. Uh, this is our study uh, where we essentially try to describe the frequency of this HPD DIC um, uh, subphenotype in a contemporaneous cohort of patients with septic shock. And we tested two hypotheses, the first of which is that HPD DIC subphenotype would be characterized by a molecular signature that resembles that of patients diagnosed with MAS. And the second is that this phenotype would be an independent risk factor for death. We designed a nested case control study using patients from the process study that I told you about before. The process study enrolled 1,300 patients in 31 hospitals in the US with suspected septic shock with these criteria that you see here. And as I told you, they were randomized to different therapeutic um, strategies. The comparison was, of course, sepsis with the HPD DIC subphenotype versus patients with sepsis without that subphenotype. And we defined uh, hepatobiliary dysfunction as the liver sequential organ failure score of more than one. And DIC has platelet count less than 100,000 or INR of more than 1.5. We uh, studied the primary outcomes, the frequency, of course, of the subphenotype occurrence. Um, the differences in cytokine panel between those two groups and all-cause mortality with secondary outcomes, including hospital mortality. So the first thing we saw was that our numbers resembled those uh, that are reported by Shakuri et al. Um, uh, before. Uh, we found 6.3% of pre presentation of the HVD DIC syndrome as compared to 5.6 by Peter Shakuri and, and her group. Um, now, Professor Jamarell has published a paper recently uh, denoting this, uh, this concept of the macrophage activation like syndrome, which is defined a little bit differently because they use the H score or the HBD DIC criteria, but using the ISTH criteria for DIC. So it's a little bit more stringent, and they reported a little bit of a lower uh, proportion of patients developing this syndrome. When we looked at the cytokines and we selected 26 cytokines based on the literature and based on we, what has been reported to be associated with macrophage activation syndrome, as you see here down, in this heat map, you're just seeing quantitatively or qualitatively how the patients with HPD and DIC had a relatively higher expression of some of these markers as compared to patients with sepsis, as you can see with more red in the bottom and less and, and more blue in the top. When we did the head-to-head -head comparisons, we found that 21 out of 26 biomarkers were different between uh, sepsis controls and the sepsis uh, patients with the uh, HPD DIC subphenotype. And I'm showing you here the most salient. And what I want to point out is that you see the same usual suspects, ferritin, IL-18, IL-18 binding protein, all of the same feed-forward loop uh, players that you were seeing in the previous cartoon that we're, we were talking about. 
And this model of 26 uh, parameters, when we created a model of these 26 parameters to predict the development of HV, uh, HVDDIC subphenotype, we found that it was highly predictive. And when we did individual comparisons of the predictive capacity, you again see the IL-1 beta family, including IL-18 and IL-18 binding protein, very high in the list um, there. Now, ferritin was probably the best predictor for mortality in this cohort, which is also important uh, in terms of the clinical prognosis uh, and pronostication of these patients. When we did the model to predict now 90-day mortality, we found that these 26 parameters were very, very useful uh, with very high predictability. And we found, of course, that patients with HVDDIC subphenotype had a massive increase in hospital and 90-day mortality, as you can see in these figures. Now, in full disclosure, the HVDDIC patients had more chronic liver disease, more uh, Apache score or higher Apache scores, and higher comorbidity uh, in disease. So the next question we asked was, well, um, is it an independent risk factor for death when we include all these covariates into play? What we found was that the match cohort, it was a, an independent predictor, the presence of this phenotype. If we use the total cohort of the process trial, we found the same thing. And furthermore, if we included chronic liver disease, because remember that the liver sofa doesn't differentiate between chronic or acute liver dysfunction, when we included those patients that had chronic liver disease, still the presence of the HVDDIC subphenotype was revealing in terms of um, predicting 90-day mortality. So with this, I'll conclude um, that sepsis is a heterogeneous syndrome driven by multiple mechanisms, that the identification of endotypes and therapy-responsive phenotypes is critical to establish effective therapeutics, that this HBD-DIC subphenotype is a simple clinical strategy that can identify septic shock patients who portray biomarkers that are very similar to those displayed by macrophage activation, patients with macrophage activation and, and progress with high mortality. And I would submit that this is a strategy to perhaps enrich future clinical trials where we're trying to test these novel therapeutics uh, in order to provide uh, better, better care for our patients. So with that, I, I just want to thank my mentors uh, um, and uh, my collaborators. Renee Anderko was the first author of this paper, and she's a fantastic researcher. Uh, Scott Kanna and, of course, Vita Shapuri, which, who was uh, also part of this, of this effort, and the process investigators, of course, are funded. With that, I thank you for your attention. Marvin, you want to take? So great. Thanks a lot for that, uh, for that exciting talks. Um, so uh, we already have questions coming in on the, uh, on the app, um, of which I would like to uh, to pose one um, to you, uh, Michael Bauer. Um, very difficult one, I think, given that individual organs may greatly vary in their level of resilience and resistance, should one look for the weakest link as the key target to preserve functionality, or would you rather look at this as a combined netto effect of the organism? Actually, I guess um, I should hand over this question to Mervyn Singer, uh, who introduced the concept of multiple organ success um, uh, 10 years ago or so, or even 20 years ago. Um, I guess it's, it's very difficult um, to translate the optimal defense theory um, into a clinical practice, because I guess what um, is really intriguing. Uh, Hernando nicely showed us the role of apoptosis in cell models. Uh, but when we look into the organs, uh, we see very little cell death. Even at autopsy, the organs look pretty much normal. And I guess we have still not the magic treatment to reverse this state of dormancy or failed stress response. Um, I guess that we start with some really intriguing net responses such as the macrophage activation syndrome and hopefully will improve patient care. But this overall topic, how to 
resolve organ dysfunction in the context of a failed stress response uh, is going to be a tough one. Um, we can, first of all, understand this phenotype a bit better. And I would personally believe that macrophage activation syndrome might well be a facet that reflects allostatic overload. So some patients will reach it earlier, other will reach it later in the stage um, of their disease. So it's a, a level um, like the endophenotypes and uh, um, the, the genotypes. It, it's a very complicated layered system or hierarchical system. And um, we need to understand what brings cells into this state of dormancy and how can this be resolved. In smaller mammals, it's easier. In humans, we haven't got the clue how to reverse this state. Any comments, Hernando? Uh, so I, I completely agree with, with Michael. I, I think I, I would add that, that we're seeing the bo both both problems that that these patients face uh, sometimes. One is uh, the persistent uh, injurious stimulation, uh, which is a part of which is what I try to demonstrate with these novel treatments that you can try to halt. But the other side of the equation that has to be taken into account, which hasn't actually, is this concept of tolerance. Once the organs have shied away and stayed in this dormant uh, um, phenotype, um, how do we get them to restart? What are the mechanisms that initially lead to this dormant state? And how can we get into those mechanisms to try to jumpstart the car again and get the patient going because most of the times the insult has has gone by there's no further infections although there's questions about reinfections with viruses and so on and so forth but some of these of the times is the problem the problem is that these patients cannot actually restart their organ function and then they end up uh, actually most of them dying um you know after the families just decide that enough is enough um, so, so I think those two components will be very important moving forward to try to understand how to get these patients out of this hole. So I have here a little bit of a clinical oriented question to um, how to use this in, in practice because of the measurement of all these 26 markers is a bit much at the bedside, right? So what would you recommend to, to identify either the macrophage activated patient or the resistant patient? Um, maybe first to Hernando. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a bit biased because uh, we did this work, but uh, I, I would submit to you that, yes, with a little bit more validation work, perhaps, and perhaps including these concepts into uh, enrichment of, of uh, clinical trials, we can actually use the HBD DIC uh, features, right? Uh, th this is exactly what our study showed, that if you look clinically, at these patients and you define them as having the HBD DIC sub half hepatobiliary dysfunction and DIC together and randomize these patients to giving them IL-1 receptor antagonists and see if we can reproduce the, the data that uh, Bita Shakuri uh, produced for us a few years ago. Uh, that Again, one of the things that I pointed out was that, that the beauty of, of Bita's work uh, part of it was the simplicity of the concept of taking very clinical features and using them at bedside to try to phenotype these patients adequately. Actually, if I may add, Nicole and Hernando, um, we also include in our workup uh, SUPA, uh, this biomarker that has been uh, validated um, for the identification of COVID patients with a hyperinflammatory state. And I guess nicely complementary to the ferritin that we also measure in these patients as a routine, um, SUPA will tell you that the endothelial dysfunction is present that is characteristic of this, let's say, pro-coagulatory state of these patients. So, But I guess we are just moving in the right direction by early identification of treatable traits uh, that if they persist, just push these patients over uh, the counter. Let's put it that way. 
So continuing on the from the treatment side, um, there's a question: sh Should sepsis groups, um, perhaps proposed by Anne Cliff, the, the um, guide the treatment with steroids in septic patients? Maybe first to you, Michael. Actually, and I guess also, you know, the same question appears. What right? I think you could look at um, at the uh, the increased bilirubin and, and decreased platelets because in the end, it maybe it, it's that simple. And do mm. patients who have this phenotype do they respond better mm. to anakinra in the COVID population or in other populations? So maybe Actually, first the, step, the mm. steroids. Actually, we currently try to pin that down together with Jilali Anan uh, in the European uh, trial, um, where we really try to better define those that are responsive to steroids. But it's meanwhile really clear. I mean, the link between the stress response and steroids is obvious. And um, there are patients that benefit from steroids. There are patients that get harmed by steroids. And it's not just... Um, the inflammatory response that you treat with steroids. So I guess we need to test it, as Hernando already pointed out. We we understand now better the, the subphenotypes. Now let's get to enroll them into trials and test steroids, anakinra, and so on, in order to really get the ones that respond favorably to these interventions. Hernando? Yeah, I agree with I agree with Michael. Um, I I think uh, that uh, I mean at least in the context of MAS and HLH in in other patient populations, um, most of the times the the, the steroid regimens that uh, the people have used are are much higher than what we use in, in the septic population, right? So we're talking about pulse steroids um, for a certain amount of time, and you, you you could see how that rapidly be a a major concern uh, in, the, in the septic patient, essentially because of the consequences of steroids. I mean, we were concerned about the consequences of stress dose steroids, uh, let alone a tall steroid strategy for this, for this patient. And, and again, the other, the, other, the other component is, is uh, that, that we really don't know um, whether these patients would uh, really respond to these strategies. Uh, again, the IL-1 receptor antagonist has uh, down downside effects, right? That, that has adverse effects that that need to be accounted for in terms of the efficacy of of, of these uh, strategies to to improve the outcome. So, um, a very good question, uh, yet to be answered. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we've passed four o'clock already. I think we need to wrap up. Um, so, um, I would like to thank the uh, both the speakers for their excellent talks and the audience for their um, uh, for listening and for putting in the questions and I thought it was a wonderful discussion and uh, for those of you who have, who have uh, joined in later I'd remind you that uh, ICMX uh, has received its first impact factor at the beginning of early of next year so continue to submit your good work and maybe you will be the next presenter at the Essicum webinar uh, the next time um, so thank you to all and goodbye thank you all